Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva, and I'm hosting this summit together with my colleague who is here today with us, Ben Roberts. Hi, Ben. And uh, the other colleague, Eva Schoenfeld, who couldn't uh, be with us in this interview today. And I have the pleasure and honor to welcome Shilpa Jain to have a great talk with us. Hi, Shilpa. Welcome. Hi, Nina. Thank you. I like how you said my last name, Jain. It added a lot nice, like, musical <laughs> energy. <laughs> So, so in, 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 in your language would be Jane, Jane. Yes. Jane. Okay. Ja, Jane. <laughs> it's nice. I like that. So, <laughs> Shilpa, you, you are currently rooting yourself in Oakland, Berkeley. Uh, you serve as, at, the, at the moment as executive director of Yes, Yes World for how many years already? Uh, coming close to 10, nine and a half years. Oh, a decade. Yes works with social change maker, makers at the meeting point of internal, interpersonal, and systemic change, and aims to create, co-create a thriving, just, and balanced world for all. Prior to having this role, you were two years um, education and outreach coordinator of other worlds, and previous to that, you were involved 10 years as a learning activist with Chic Center, the People's Institute of Rethinking Education and Development, based in Udaipur, India, doing wonderful work with Swaraj University. Or you, you served as actually as coordinator of the Swapat, Swapathgami, Walkouts, Walkons networks, basically the network of people who go through Swaraj University, uh, and maybe we'll talk a bit about that. Yes, uh, yeah. I didn't say it right, but the it's network of um, of walkouts, Walkons. Hopefully, we'll know a bit more. What is that? I really hope so. And you've been doing research and written numerous books and articles, facilitate workshops and gatherings on topics including globalization, creative expression, ecology, democrat democratic living, innovative learning and unlearning. And you are very committed to use very simple human technologies like listening, speaking from the heart, slowing down, breathing and connecting to nature to support authentic relationships and a deeper sense of self, an essential shift in consciousness and aligned living practices. I notice how I, I when I read this part of your bio, I get I also start to slow down and pause. That feels already great. So Chilpa, once again, welcome. We would really love to hear a bit of your journey and how you came to do this work. It's amazing. It feels like already quite interesting, amazing set of experiences. Could you tell us a bit more about what what stepping stones led you to this place? Sure, you are in thank now. you, you know. Um, well, I was, uh, I think the, the first stepping stone really is um, where I grew up and how I grew up. My parents both immigrated from India in the early 70s, and so... I was um, born and raised in a suburb of Chicago, and my, I always say my first teachers of community building were my parents, who really wanted us to stay connected, my brother and I to stay connected to Rajasthani culture and community, and so they made friends with all of these beautiful people all around the city of Chicago. So we would drive every weekend and spend time and meet these aunties and uncles and their kids and families and it's where I imbibed a lot of um, my own uh, culture of origin in India. And also just the idea that community was built these very simple ways of just sharing time, sharing food, sharing stories together, playing together. There was, the adults would play, the kids would play. There was a lot of joy in that um, time and also share struggles and, and things that were hard. So the sense of vulnerability that comes both through play and through sharing struggle was something I feel like I, I imbibed at a very young age, at a very early age. Um, another part of my beautiful upbringing was that I grew up in an incredibly multicultural neighborhood um, full of early immigrants from other countries to the U.S. And so my neighbors were Korean and Taiwanese and Thai and 
um, Pakistani and Indian and Chinese and from all over. And it was incredible to grow up and just to go down the street and visit different friends or hang out at their homes and learn so much. And it just felt normal to me, which is also such a gift. So some of, I think my passion and interest in different cultures and bridge building also started in a very natural way um, through, through friends of different backgrounds as well as different religions and so many other things. So that was kind of an early stepping stone. And then I started to get very interested. I have an older brother who some people know, um, who, you know, when I was younger, started to feed me little information about different movements and organizations and things. So, you know, I was in fifth grade writing letters already to <laughs> save the environment or getting interested in human rights at like ninth grade and things like that because of both his um, support and also some of the opportunities in my school. And Shilpa, how old were you when he, when he turned his back on, you know, this uh, career as Wall Street and then, well, later on also then with UNESCO and, start, and went back to India? How old oh, and how old was I when my brother did those things? Um, I think that was be 1992. 1992 is oh, when no. he went to UNESCO. So I was 15. Wow. Yeah. And um, when he went back to India, I was like 21. Oh, yeah, nice. something like that, I think. Yeah, for the years, if I'm adding up the years, 20 or something. <laughs> So yeah, he was definitely an early influencer in my life of, of kind of being able to make my own path and that it was okay, that I didn't have to follow the roads that were sort of laid out for me in some ways. Um, so I definitely have a lot of appreciation and love for my brother, who also was an instigator and would give me a lot of things to, to you know, lift up my um, curiosities. And then in my own journey, you know, I think I, I have a really pivotal experience from when I was in about 19 years old. And I thought maybe I'd become a doctor. My mother's a doctor. I thought, okay, maybe I'll become a doctor. And I did an internship in Cook County Hospital in Chicago and was working in the trauma ward, which is like the most, you know, intense of medicine. And I stayed overnight there one night and a, a man came in with a gunshot wound to his arm. And, and I realized in that moment, like, I'm more concerned about why he's being shot and what's happening in, the, in our communities and in this world than I am about getting, you know, the bullet out of his body um, and healing him. Not that that work isn't super important. And I loved all the trauma surgeons who were there. It's just that that wasn't where my heart was. My heart was in like, what are the conditions that are creating this kind of violence and conflict? So switched gears, ended up moving to India, as you shared, working with Shikshantar, um, kind of walked out on my own sort of path of, of what I was supposed to do. So that's, the, that's where walkout comes in, yeah? You just turn your yeah. back from a place or a system that you don't, that don't serve you anymore. Right, right. In the spirit of like walking out is to, to just, if I see something that's unjust or it's not working, doesn't feel in alignment with my soul, then I can walk out. And then the part of walking on is creating something that does feel in alignment, creating pathways, creating um, opportunities. But sometimes I need to first walk out and make the space before I even know what I can create. You know, just, just that residence. And of course, there's a long, long histories of labor movements and student movements and the civil rights movement and so many movements of people walking out as part of the, the beginning point, the entry point towards walking on. Um, so yeah, so that, that took me on a whole <laughs> big journey. And in that journey is when I also met Yes, um, which, you know, is based here in California and became one of the facilitators and partners of the organization to create jams and, and so on and so forth, which I'll get into more, but those are, I think are some good pivotal moments in my early life that, that led me on this path. Yeah. So per perhaps then we can go a bit into the particularities of your work with the Yes world and the, some of the events you do and how that relates with the topic of this summit with conflict and what kind of practices you do there to help uh, deal with these difficult situations and tensions in between us and inside of us and between people and, and groups. Well, you just, you know, you named kind of what's at the heart of Yes's work, which is the sense that transformation happens on three levels, right? It happens inside of ourselves. It happens between us interpersonally, so personally, interpersonally, and it happens systemically, what's in our world. And um, when I encountered my first jam, which was back in 2002, almost, you know, almost 18 years ago, 
I, it was the first time where I'd sort of sat in a circle in a way where people were intent on being honest and being vulnerable and authentic and willing to do the hard work together and the, the joyful play together of, of connecting, of connecting, especially across differences and divides, um, which there were a lot of, there was a ton of diversity. We were 30 people from 20 countries, um, gender expressions, um, race and ethnicity, um, class backgrounds, kinds of work that we were doing, you know, some age diversity, we were kind of mostly 18 to 30 year olds, but um, that, you know, it was just the, the focus was how do we understand ourselves and how do we relate to what each other if we're trying to manifest this world that we all want to see, what what's in there? What what is that about? And um, we had some and an, an like incredible moments of very profound conflict that happened in the group, and the art and the act and the commitment to work through those, you know, and to do it in a in a loving, generative way, in an honest way, not in one way stepping away from honesty and, and authenticity, but like fully embracing that and continuing to work through it was so profound it was so profound and I hadn't seen anything like that most of what I'd seen in activism up to that point I'd been an activist for a long time you know all through grade school high school college all of that but I, mostly what I'd seen is like we're right you're wrong we're gonna convince you why we're right and you're wrong and if you're not convinced then you're just on the on the wrong side of this and that's that you know and it wasn't about bridging it wasn't about synergizing and then the jam itself the idea of jam this was the world youth leadership jam the jam comes from the me metaphor of musicians that when we listen to each other we each bring our unique sound we each bring our unique instrument as musicians but we listen to each other and then we create something that hasn't been heard before because we're synergizing we're we're willing to kind of let go a little bit and open more and then receive and then integrate and then and so on. And so that's what we did as human beings, as activists, as, you know, we were all kind of in different social justice, environmental peace, um, kind of different kinds of work. So to come together in that way in that first jam was very profound for me. And I hadn't seen that. I hadn't seen that in my activist journey to that point. So that became a turning point for me. And, and the, the kind of hosting group of that work invited me to become a facilitator with them and a participant in the programs more. And started to expand and deepen and that's its whole long journey. But yes, it's kind of taken that sense of jams as like the, the cornerstone stone of like, how do we build community that is vulnerable, authentic and co-liberating as much as collaborating, you know, we're, we're working together to both free ourselves from the structures and the binds that we are inside of us as well as outside of us and to collaborate together to like create different kinds of, both inner and interpersonal and systemic systems, all those different kinds of ways to, to make the world we want to see. Yeah. That's awesome. Perhaps you could tell us a bit because you, you mentioned uh, the, the, a lot of work being put in the design of the gems, but I think in, from what I sense in the work of YES uh, in general around how to build community, you know, grounded in these in this ways that people can liberate from ingrained ideas that get us uh, stuck but also dealing with with you know uh, unavoidable tensions and and things that emerge as we try to be more more authentic and more uh, vulnerable and also more honest with with what we really think and feel in, every, in that those are unavoidable so could you tell us a bit what are the the what are the elements the the different aspects that you consider when you do when you design these events and then like elements that when it's being implemented that are fundamental for you in doing this kind of work yeah for sure so um every jam starts with a beautiful team a unique and diverse team of people who feel committed to bring that to that inner work and that interpersonal and systemic work, even just starting as a team, you know, as individuals and as a, as a collective and that team together um, creates an invitation. So there's the team, then there's the invitation and the invitation is super powerful because it's about the questions that we're willing to engage in ourselves. Um, and it holds this piece of integrity that it's not about 
okay, I'm doing this for you. No, no, you come to my event. Now it's like, I'm doing this. And I would love for you to join me also because I'm not going to, I'm also committed to doing this. I'm not leaving you to do this and watch you. I'm going to do this with you. So there's this very beautiful invitation that goes out. Um, another core element of that is when we come together as whoever, the, whoever responds to that invitation, they're also core in that because they've said, yes, they said, yes, I want to be there. And that commitment I think is where the jam begins. You know, they, there's a, an application to kind of prepare yourself and that's where the jam begins. Cause I'm willing to say, I want to dive into these questions. I want to explore the questions that are alive for me. I want to explore my growing edges, the places of struggle, the places of, um, joy the places of, of 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 growth that i want so that's these are like sort of the rudimentary elements this team this invitation and this application and willingness to say yes and coming and then once we begin there's a lot about how do we create a container that can really nourish and support the kinds of inquiries and learnings and growth that we want to have and so there's many many elements to that container and i'll just name a few of them one of them, of course, is just arriving and grounding in the place. We often choose beautiful places in nature, a little bit away from the you know, distractions of, of urban or modern life in these ways, because nature is sometimes we call it the, the seventh, sixth or seventh facilitator, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's, it it's has, part of the process, yeah? Absolutely. And the more we tap into initially and start to feel, oh, nature is here to hold us and support us. And we also support her in all of these beautiful ways. The more that sort of infuses that it becomes nature becomes a jammer in the experience, you know, also, also co-creating. Um, another big part of our opening has a deep, deep welcome and welcoming all parts of ourselves, welcoming the parts of ourselves that we love, that we're, you know, happy to show up on our bios and the parts of ourselves that we're like, I hope no one finds out that about me. And that's also welcome, you know, and actually the more that we welcome of all of our wholeness, that wholeness then infuses the energy of the whole container. And the more whole we're, we are, the better our, you know, the, you know, one of the core feelings is that the solutions that we have are already there. Every solution we need is already here. It's just a matter of maybe we haven't heard each other or we haven't listened to ourselves, even the solutions that are inside of ourselves for our own selves, um, or, you know, heard what's out in the world enough to connect the dots to the solutions, to connect and make the, the synapses, you know, fire to make it, to make those solutions show up. So that welcome kind of is like, bring all of yourself because every part of you is part of this, you know, every part of you is part of the solution. Um, there are other beautiful core elements of the, of the container that building, but I'll, I'll just name one more, which is intention setting and setting, uh, shifting from like, I have expectations, which is usually when I'm putting something on you, whether you agree to it or not, sometimes you don't even know about it or not. I put that on you and then I'm waiting for you to, to do that for me, which is an expectation, making the shift to an intention. Like, this is what I'm, I'm intending to. I'm intending to learn about myself. I'm intending to make friends. I'm intending to work with my vulnerability. I'm intending to be caring. I'm intending to be generous. Whatever it is, I'm then responsible. I'm putting that forward and I'm infusing it. And when all of our intentions come together, I think of it as like profound spell casting, right? Each one of us putting in these intentions the way we do the process is that actually we don't read our own intentions. We read other people's intentions. We don't know whose intentions we're reading, but we read them as they're our own. And collectively, then we're holding this space that all of these intentions can manifest. Everything can manifest in our container. Um, so anyway, there's, there's many other elements, but those are some of the, the key ones that sort of shape what can then happen and take place going forward. So, so I can imagine, sorry, Ben, just one more question regarding this, <laughs> this element. There's, I can imagine that, that part of the design is really quite open and emergent in a way because, I mean, you accommodating these different intentions as they come together in the space then um, might require to do so, right? So you work a lot with uh, uh, what's, what's unfolding during the jam yes yes well we also come up with something that's called the super draft tentative flow <laughs> which 
<laughs> comes out of the applications and also the team's own inquiries. So, you know, the synergy, just trying to at least kind of map out, okay, there's a beginning, a middle, and end. We, we notice that these are some shared things that, that, that our group is interested in, where there's a common interest in leadership, for example. There's a common interest in this particular political moment, you know, depending on what, when the jam is, where it is. Or there's a common interest in, um, let's say, relationships and intimacy, you know. Um, just There might be different themes that come. Or, wow, we notice a lot of people are working with challenges with their inner critic. A lot of that, that's come up. Wow, that's a shared theme. Or, wow, you know, in, in certain contexts, whatever our contexts are, whatever the hot issue and diversity is, it could be race, could be class, could be gender, could be religion, whatever it is, that's hot. We need to work with that. You know, that's really present. So we, we bring that. We also, over the course of doing so many jams, it's, we've been jamming for 20 years now, there's also learnings that there are things that help our community. It helps if early on in our gathering, we do a check-in circle where every single person has about three minutes to share what's alive for them. So everyone gets to be seen. That that builds our container even more. Or it helps us to have certain tools introduced in our community, such as the zones of learning and awareness, if understanding how we learn, or certain tools like um, the compass of reactions, which shows us when we're not being able to be present, what's happening for us, so we can become more aware of that. These tools are helpful. They've really helped us navigate conflicts much better and work through those synergy moments much better. There's many, many other tools. But so we've noticed and learned some things and then connecting those pieces. And we're always prepared to be surprised and change. You know, but I, I'm never, I, I could show you. I wish I have one handy. I could pull one out. But it always starts out as this nice, beautiful, pristine piece of paper. And on, on the first day, I'm already Xing things. That didn't happen. We had to move this here. Nope, uh, we're not going to do that. That didn't, nope, that's not what's real anymore. Now it's this, you know, this is what's now present here. And so it never follows that super draft tentative flow. And yet we know that there's this, these shared intentions and these shared um, inquiries that are also part of it. And a beginning and a middle and an end. We need to end somewhere to start our next beginning, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned context a minute ago um, and this idea of, you know, gathering around common interests and, and, and you know, shared intentions, which I connect up with um, also, you know, the, the building of the container. And um, I'm thinking about another conversation I was in recently where people were talking about the importance of powerful questions and, and all a lot of us came out of the, the the field of dialogue. I hear a lot of, you know, art of hosting kind of parallels in what you're saying. And I think there's, I'm sure there's been some cross pollinating there and, and, you know, the art of powerful questions comes out of that. And, um, you know, but what we were noticing or what I was noticing in this conversation the other day, and I've noticed in other spaces was a sense of, um, that, that, that I'm in a lot of spaces where we seem to be good at asking what appear on the surface to be powerful questions, but somehow they're not, I'm not experiencing them and I'm not sensing the group experiencing them as powerful. And my, my story about that, that I came to the other day was that it had to do with the context. So, you know, if you look at the principles of World Cafe, asking powerful questions is one of the principles, but the first one is set the context. And it seems like what you've become really skilled at here in this crafting of the container, in the sharing of intentions, in the welcome, in the grounding in nature, all of that is somehow that you're you're managing to 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 create the context in which asking these questions actually can matter. It's so I think where we get into conflict and where we feel stuck and challenged so often is we feel like we have the right questions, but we even if we got the answer, we feel like it wouldn't make a difference because we couldn't, we don't have the context in which to act on that. Or we're not sure what context is the right one to address this thing because where do we have agency? Where do we have power? We want to change ourselves inside, but we also want to change the systems as well as the, the inner, you know, the community level in between our relationships. And it's very challenging, I think, to create context where all of those things seem possible. So it, it seems there's some magic in what you've discovered that, that is that is allowing that to surface. Mm, yeah, thank you for that, Ben. I think there's a few things, you know, one is I'm, I'm, I'm asking questions that are, bring, you know, in a way we talk about the jam is like the personal, interpersonal, systemic, they're all integrating here in the center of the jam. 
right? So my experience as an Indian American woman living in the United States, all those identities that come with that, you know, and there's so much more I can say about that, but all of that as Shilpa myself in this structural reality, building the really, and I'm trying to build a relationship with you, you know, and here you are, we are in this little microcosm you know, an, an exploration of what did it looks like in the in the world to build these relationships across these divides. And so I think that the questions are, they're so rooted in the heart and they're so rooted in the body versus like, they're not like, they're not questions just from here. They're really questions from here. Like, what does it look like for us to be in authentic relationship together? You and me, you know, and even beyond that, then how does it, what does it look like to really work together given all of the truths of our realities? mashing up and sometimes bashing into each other and sometimes and then we're going to have this this friction and how do we work through that and so it's very real you know i think and that's that's part of it another part of it is that with the with the facilitation team that's there we call ourselves facilitants you know we're all participating in the jam we're full participants and so the unmasking that's there and the reality that's there for us that that context is driven It's not driven, it's driven from our own hearts, our own experiences, and we're integrating and and connecting all of these, what we're experiencing with the people there. So there's something about that that I think is also part of the magic, like, um, and and it's a core element that, like, I have to speak from myself, I have to speak from the I, and it's one of the core pieces that shifts so much, because then we're creating context that's incredibly relevant, it's grounded in in our bodies, in my body, you know, it's grounded in your body. And then here we are, we're going to manifest something that's very real. So um, I think that's really powerful what you're sharing, that it matters why I'm doing something. It matters for whom, for what, you know, it matters where it is and what it means in this moment. And I think the more allowance we have for that diversity of realities, the more that context gets it just widens, you know, it becomes more and more inclusive. It becomes more and more, um, yeah, meaningful for for each person who's there. So those are just some of the things that I think play into that is that, that speaking from the eye, that willingness to unmask as, as leadership and the willingness to say, we're, I'm in it together in this very real tangible way in this very moment, not as an esoteric thing, but like right now, here and now, what does this mean? You know? Um, and the community, as a, as a container to support that, right? So it's not just you and me trying to figure this out alone in this individualistic way. No, we're held in a container that is saying, I'm inviting your wholeness. I'm here for you to slow down. I'm here for you to F up. I'm here for you to you know, be your whole self. And I'm not gonna let you go because of that. And that I think is really distinctive also, which is hard, which is hard, you know? It's hard work, but, but that is like the commitment in the container of like, let's just keep working on this. We're going to keep working on this and Mm. we're going to have breakthroughs. That's great. I wonder if you have a nice, if if you can recall a story where in a jam where you you experienced like a a difficult conflict in, in the group or in group and team or something that could, could be a, a showcase for us to kind of get a bit into what the process looks like <laughs> I'll as, try. It, as it's happening, you know? Yes, I'll try. I'll have to mention. You, you, don't, you don't need to mention names. That's what I was yeah. going to say yeah, or can, places. Can, or can, <laughs> what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. Exactly. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. My mind is flooded with so many stories, but I'll just pick one. Um, the first one that came to me with was, it was a Middle East jam, Middle East Youth Leadership Jam, so bringing together um, – young leaders ages, you know, 20 to 40 from around the region of all the way from Morocco to Turkey, Pakistan, actually, and all the way, you know, Azerbaijan down to even Ethiopia, like this just wide region. And um, I remember there was a participant who was really struggling throughout the entire jam, like very agitated, not able to really engage. And the other participants and myself too, were like, come on, man, like, what's up with you? Why, what's, come on, like, this is here, space, and we're in, this, in the desert of Jordan, and Wadi Ram, it's incredibly beautiful. This beautiful group of humans doing this work, and it's hard, and he's just like, mm. 
um, and he's from Iraq. And so everyone wants to hear him. Everyone cares, you know, like we know shit is hard in Iraq. We want to hear you, you know, but he's just not, not interested in sharing what's happening for him or any of the exercises, just really kind of like, so we finally get to like the last closing circle of the jam. This is a week long jam. You know? you get to the closing circle and it's his chance to share because everyone gets a chance to share in the closing. And, and um, he starts to speak and I just had this instinct, like something's maybe, maybe this is the moment. And I stand up and just come and sit next to him in the circle and just with him. And he starts to say, basically, like, nobody wants to hear what I'm going through because it's too hard and it's too difficult and nobody wants to hear about it. And I just gently, you know, because we've had this very, like, loving, like, okay, if I put my hand on your back and put my hand on his back, he says, okay, and I put my hand on his back and, I'm like, we're here for you. And one of my co-facilitators, you know, across the circle says, I really, really want to hear you. I really want to hear your story. And he starts to share and he starts to cry. And he says, I don't want to cry. I don't want to cry. And I say to him, you know, that ship has sailed. We're here now. It's okay. <laughs> and, you know, that laughter kind of opens that he laughs a bit and then he, you know, cries more and he shares the, sh the struggles that he's really going through and the intensity of what it is to live in Iraq in this time. This is um, about 2014. So, but what happens in the group is here's the group that has been mildly irritated to maximally irritated with him most of the jam because of his kind of distractedness and not really, you know, they're all going through their own processes and they're like, okay, but nobody's like, leave, you know, they're just like, all right, we'll wait for you, dude, you know, it's here. And the whole group, you know, feel the circle, the entire group leans in and energetically there's a space and we, you know, we, in those moments, we drop into ancient time, right? There's no time mm. and space. It's just mm. here. And he shares and, you know, people are of course also crying with him or feeling that and just with him in this moment. And I'm, I'm offering that story because it's like, it's the last possible moment. You know, the next morning we're leaving the desert, right? We're just, we're in the evening afternoon sessions turning into evening but nobody moves nobody's like i need to go eat dinner i need to go to the bathroom i need to they're just like we're here completely committed because now we're seeing now you're you're here and we're not going to leave you you know and so anyway it's it's it was magical it was in it's one of those moments that even if i'm talking about it right now i can feel you know tingles in my body and um and it completes and he finishes sharing and people hug him. And like, it's just a lot of joy from, from his, his honesty and his sharing. He's there. And, and then spontaneously a big part of the group erupts in kind of a shared prayer circle across faiths, across Islam, Christianity, Judaism, you know, whatever different practices, pagan practices, <laughs> different things that people are doing and believing in. And they just create something together. And it was, it was so beautiful, you know, just this honoring of spirit that showed up in that moment. So I'm offering, this is like one story and I could tell you hundreds of stories like this, you know, um, of just what it takes to really work through that kind of, I don't know, that, that, that what it is to, to really be committed to wholeness and what it is to really be committed to community and um to not give up on each other right yeah i was just ben let me just say one thing on this because i was i was just thinking about that that uh uh that's very very counterintuitive to what is mainstream that is you know like if you have a conflict with someone else you got, you to take care of it and and not and this i think part of what allowed that to happen is that actually you have everybody kind of holding the space for for this unfolding that you don't know what it's going to happen, but you are there you, and you sit with as much time as you as you as as it's needed. Yeah, well, time was what stood out to me too. You know, so much it was a beautiful story, but just you know, you were there for a week. 
that's you know in the grand scheme of things it's not much time but in the context of how how much we invest in in so many of our gatherings you know that's that's a lot of time our summit is spread out over five weeks but people will be in it you know in punctuated ways so Anyway, I think the importance of, of slowing down, you look at ancient traditions, of course, you know, people gather in a circle and they stay there until, you know, the, the situation is, is resolved and people are ready to move on. It's not like there's a meeting clock and, you know, an hour's up, sorry, you know, we have to go now. So there's something about the power of taking the time we need that I'm hearing in that story, along with the, the radical inclusion, the saying that, you know, we will still hold you and hold space for you even if your presence is disruptive, even if you're clearly not happy, you know, you are welcome here and we want to hear you. Yeah, I, I think about that time. You know, it's funny, um, I, several people who've been to the Middle East Jam say, like, if we could only get all the Middle East leaders for to spend one week together, then conflicts that have taken hundreds of years, you know, thousands of years, maybe they could resolve. Because time is such a funny thing. It's just a kind of... It's arbitrary, relatively. Like, I've been in context where I've had a conflict, you know, but I had a conflict with my brother that was kind of deepening and deepening and deepening. And it was sort of seven years of conflict, and we sat together for seven hours, and things profoundly shifted, profoundly shifted. So what is seven hours to seven years, you know? What is a week to, like, a lifetime, maybe 25 years or 30 years of a bias against a particular people or a kind of place you know it's nothing it's it's immaterial so yeah i was, I was thinking that should be even even more in the context of one one thing you mentioned before that is there's uh people go with an intention to explore a certain question and it's to explore the question and i think we short we make shortcuts because we want to respond we want to find answers immediately you know and this time or this the time needed to really sink into a question is fundamental in, before, you know, getting on a way out with some sort of, of uh, solution. Definitely. I mean, I also, I, just for contrast, the New York City jam, that's only happened once because all the New Yorkers left the New York after doing the jam. They were like, why are we in New York? Um, no, not all, but almost all. But the New York City jam, they were like, well, the maximum we'll be able to get New Yorkers is two and a half days. So starting on a Friday, you know, ending on a Monday. And they, I, I wasn't present at that jam. Um, but what I hear from my friends who were the facilitators there, they're like, we were New Yorkers at that. We went in full and hard. First day, boom, everyone in their opening check-in, boom, boom, boom. Everyone shared so much and so vulnerable. Boom, boom, boom. It was in. And it, it was just that commitment, right? Like, here's whatever time we have. We want to use this time powerfully. We want to make this, you know. And so they went in. And they went in deep and they, they had like, you know, a beginning that was a day. They had a middle that was a day and they'd end. Most jams, we have a beginning that's a day. We have a few days of a middle and then we have, you know, a day at the end. But like they just went in and I always laugh when I hear that story because it's like they they understood their context and in their reality, here we are. We, you know, time is time is short in New York, but we're going to make this time ancient time. You know, we work a lot with Kronos and Kairos, modern time and ancient time. Yeah. They both matter. You know, it matters to go to the bathroom. It matters to get food. It matters to have these things in a timely way. Um, and, and we can still have ancient time, even with that. So. Yeah. And I was thinking, although uh, I hear the thing of context, I'm, I'm kind of holding the, those two days and a half in comparison with, for instance, the, the practice of, of some Inuit people that stay that you know when they there's a, a sense in the community that they they um, they are sitting either with something new or there's something that something is going to happen. They go on a an, on a um, on a common house and they stay for as long as necessary, sometimes days, waiting for a certain song to emerge, which means something new to emerge that is going to be um, informative for them as a community, you know, but to stay with all that time. And, and that made me, the, 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 for me, the trigger was like, 
what what could it be that we are excluding or leaving out when we want to do things fast? Because it's true, we can still go deep, but I'm sure that there will there will be things left out just because you don't take the time to <laughs> to be in that not knowing or. I have a colleague who says you need at least two sleeps. That there's a magic to having two two overnight cycles, and the, you know you can bring in the dream time, and things get to cook and settle. And so two and a half days, you, you hit that bare minimum. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and of course, in that context, when you're used to 30 minute meetings, like two and a half days is extravagance, you know. It's, yeah, it's a so luxury. It's, it's so, it's such a, you know, it's a, a bit of a funny thing, but it really is kind of about the, the intention and the container and the community that makes these these things possible. I think another thing I want to share is that the orientation that I have in this, I came to this over time and in the jam as well, we explore this, which is around the idea that conflict is neutral. Conflict is not bad, which is mostly what I feel like I sort of learned a bit as a child. Um, that, you know, if I'm having a fight or an argument or a disagreement with someone, it's a bad thing, but it's not bad, you know? And I also kind of unlearned this as a child too, is watching my parents when they would argue is like, they're just not getting each other. You know, they're just not hearing each other. It's not really like mom is wrong for wanting this or dad is wrong for wanting that. It's like they just don't see that they could both actually get what they want if they hurt each other, you know, hurt, heard, listened, not hurt. <laughs> um, and so with that orientation of shifting, like, okay, conflict is neutral. What's missing here? What's missing here is can I be with the discomfort of listening? To something I don't want to maybe listen to, some perspective I don't want to hear. It can also be with the discomfort of sharing vulnerably. What does this mean to me, this moment that I'm feeling this conflict in? And can we both listen? And with all sometimes of the context and the swirls around us that feels like we're carrying thousands of years of baggage and, you know, but we can't, you know, we're also humans, single humans here. So can we, can we both listen enough, slow down enough and be supported enough in a container, again, not on our own off somewhere, but in a container, to slow down enough to really listen and work through that discomfort together and trust that there's a way to work through it. And that could be my own internal discomfort with stuff that's going on. It could be with one other person or a group of people. And it could be, of course, with some things that are happening in our world, you know, that are creating a lot of um, tension. And when we're not able to listen, this is where the breakdowns happen, right? This is like, I know you don't know. My, I had an uncle who used to jokingly say my way or the highway, right? Like, that's it. And, and in that place, we, we create walls. We create distance. Um, and when we are able to listen, we create closeness, right? There's, it's a really simple thing. If, if I notice if at the other side of this conversation, do I feel closer to you or distant from you? Then I know where I've moved towards. Like, I know uh, maybe there's more there to resolve. There's more there to listen if I feel distant. Um, and maybe I also only have this much capacity to listen in this moment and I need to have food and I need to have rest and then I can come back and listen in a better way. So it's a, it's a big shifting in terms of how we understand what, what conflict means, you know, it's just the meeting point of differences. And yeah, I, w I was, uh, I was hearing you and, and, and thinking on, on, uh, the, the role we haven't been talking a lot yet, but he's like. Uh, the facilitators, those holding space, because yeah, I wonder like what from your experience of working with teams, and I'm sure you mentored a lot of people. What do you what do you would consider as critical inner gestures or dispositions or abilities that people need to work through in order to be, you know, in a place that they can help others in a, in a group to to hold space for these kind of conversations mm. because I can feel that there's a lot of like when when to know should we move forward and continue staying here or should we now maybe the energy is now to stop and just go and breathe and eat and drink sleep and then maybe we can go back to this and there's it's it's very complex <laughs> so yeah. It's complex and it's simple in a way. And the yeah. simplicity part of it is just watching our bodies and knowing our own bodies. So if in my own body, I'm feeling agitated and I'm not being able to listen, 
then chances are, you know, the, the, the joke in facilitation or joke or the reality, I don't know, is like, if I'm feeling something, probably at least three other people in the room are feeling the same thing. And so if I'm feeling that, oh, I, I'm panicking, I can't listen, then I might need to take a breath. I may need to say, can you be with this? Because it's bringing up a lot of stuff in me. You know, so I think some of the qualities that I'm that I I look for and that we look for in, in our teams is like, first, am I willing to to be honest? Am I willing to take off my own mask and share vulnerably? What's what's my experience? That's the first and most important thing, that participation. Because without that, then we turn into like a workshop, you know, which is not the same thing as a jam. In a jam, we're all here, we're all co-creators. So I'm willing to unmask, I'm willing to be real about my own stuff. And that makes that realness starts to infuse the space. That's first. Second, can I support people? Not by giving them solutions or trying to fix them, but just, can I just be there with people? And can I be there with all different kinds of people? Or do I feel like I can only be there for like this kind of person? Well, then probably it's harder to be part of the, the whole, whole holding it. But okay, no, I actually can. I feel comfortable like being with different kinds of people. I'm willing to stretch and grow where I don't feel comfortable to work on that. So those are the first most core qualities that I, I look for. Um, and then there's other beautiful, you know, things of like initiatives and warmth and energy and, you know, all of those things that are complementary um, leadership sort of qualities. But it's not the thing of like, are you, am I a well-spoken person who can frame things in the best way? And that can come later and I can explain activities later. And, you know, those things I can learn. But this thing, this core thing, which is like, can I be real? And can I offer care and receive care? Those things, that's kind of at the heart of it for, for working with um, for working with conflict, I think as well. And then these are fine tunings, you know, like, you know, no, it's like, okay, I have to learn a little bit about my own body and notice my body and say, okay, that's a self-awareness growth piece of like, when things are getting hot, what do I do? Do I go into, we talk about it as like comfort zone, stretch zone, panic zone. Do I go into my panic zone where I shut down or start to fight or like blame or whatever? Okay, if I can, I notice that, can I breathe through that and come back to a space of stretch zone and openness, you know, or do I need help with that? That's okay. We all need help sometimes, you know, and we can access that help. So there's a lot of like the self-awareness work and then group reading energy work. We kind of also learn and build up that capacity as a, as a team. So, okay. I'm noticing like it's been an hour and a half. We need to kind of eat food, go to the bathroom, do things that are going to help us become more present again, because we all have limited capacities for presence. And once our presence starts to disintegrate, then the ability to work through the conflict is going to disintegrate as well. Um, it doesn't do us much good if it's like our quality of listening has now deteriorated. We're not going to get through that conflict, you know. And sometimes it's okay. We, we don't have to. It's not a we have to push and fight and make it all the way through every single time right at that moment. Sometimes things need more time to marinate. And they need different energies and different processes and different ways to, to play with them. So this is a learning process over time. And yeah, a lot of support to the teams that keep learning and trying. And, you know, I can tell stories about that too. <laughs> but yeah, it's a journey. And, and do you find sometimes even when you're, you know, you're doing everything well and you're not pushing and you're leaving the space and letting people recharge and you know creating the right container that the conflicts don't don't always resolve and that just as conflict you know it's a reframe to say conflict is neutral it's also maybe a reframe to say it isn't always the right outcome for the conflict to go away is that part of your experience yeah. i'm curious yeah, yeah and I, I think about it less that the conflict goes away more than there's an understanding and a connection built right so conflict sometimes just to me means like we're not able to make the connection. And so sometimes, yeah, sometimes we can't make the connection, you know, yeah, especially if the people involved in it don't want to make the connection. I don't want to connect with you. Well, there's nothing much I can do about that. Right. right? And maybe um, that's not always wrong. Maybe that's, you know, the best that this situation can hold, I guess, exactly. is, is where the shift exactly. might be from my perspective, because it'd be so hard for me not to see that as well. Somehow we failed. If only we could have gotten past this or that so they could see one another more clearly and have empathy, et cetera, you know. Yeah. But that's, I have to remind myself, I can't take responsibility for 
everyone's capacity. That's beyond my, I, I the best I can do is take responsibility for my own capacity, you know? Well, and, to be honest, I'm actually thinking about a situation I'm in too, where I'm just really <laughs> struggling to, to say I, I'm willing to work through to whatever the other side is with someone. <laughs> and that, well, that's the truth, right? It's like, okay, I have to what, what am I willing to do here, you know? Um, and and sometimes as a facilitator myself or someone on my team will be like, I, I don't want to deal with that person, you know, anymore. I'm like, I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I can't make you no more than I could make myself if I didn't want to, you know? And I have to recognize like, okay, so there's distance. This isn't the end of the story. Can I also hold conflict as like an open story? Sometimes we get through the whole journey and we're like connected again. We feel that sometimes we're in the middle of the story. And I've, I've had that enough in my life where I've like wished that the story was complete, you know, and sometimes I have to be like, maybe this is one of those books I just put down and I don't know when I'm going to pick it up again, you know? Um, and I still know that it's still in the middle of the story. Yeah. It's Even always, it, 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 it's always in the process of, of, of becoming, right? So I was yeah. thinking like even an unsolved conflict is going to shape you no matter what you do. So anyway, we'll come out of it and then because either it's because we, we kind of sort something out and that opened all sorts of possibilities or because we are still trapped in and, and there are people trapped for a whole life in a, in a conflict with someone else. or So it's really... Amazing. We have we have to do the final round to wrap up things. Time has gone fast. So I was thinking, like, who wants to start? <laughs> and just like trying to figure out. I think from my side, there was a lot. There was a lot of, of great things you shared, Chilpa. Uh, this this idea of collaborating being as important as collaborating for me really feels dear and true particularly because we come to places of interaction and interbeing filled with, with traumas and deep wound, deeply seated wounds uh, from our own personal lives, but also from our collective lives and the culture we grow up in and our ancestry. And so this is really a, a opportunity. It's in the relationship that we kind of um, get liberated from that or heal that. But also some, a lot of things that are ingrained, like right when as we grow up, things that are ingrained in certain world, certain worldviews that are infused in us, and then what is right right way to be and the wrong way to be, and we kind of um, you you kind of hinted us or, or showed us how elements of how to create spaces where we can work with that and show up more authentically and more vulnerably. And another thing that I think was just mentioned briefly, but is really dear, is look at nature and the context as as par active participants in the in the becoming of of the of the events of the things we of the the spaces you create, welcoming definitely, and having a clear intention in the invitation. So it's that's even before the welcoming were really aspects that. Uh, I felt really, really important for, you know, creating that kind of container. And yeah, please let us know if there's something else you'd like to share uh, that you feel is missing from all this. And Ben, be, be, maybe before Ben, you want to say also something. Just to reflect, yeah, that, that um, one of the, the, the nature element stood out to me, the welcoming element stood out in part because there's, it, it mirrors so much with our conversation with John Young and the eight shields process. And, um, and I think also not in addition to some of the specific insights around the importance of those things in creating space, um, you both have a certain presence, you know, you embody, what it is you stand for and so i've just appreciated spending this time with you and i can you know, you've 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 just made visible in this simple direct way the connection between the inner transformational work and the ability to serve transformation at, at the collective scale and the systemic scale because i think you you, you just show up and hold it that way mm -hmm. um, so thank you thank you thank you both yeah thank you for those reflections I think the only thing I add that I didn't touch on too much, which is funny to me because it's so 
for <laughs> is listening, is, is how crucial and vital listening is and the quality of the listening. And I think something I've been working like the m- listening muscle I've been building for a long time is like listening as a witness. And um, one of a, a jammer, you know, once framed it as listening as a withness, you know, I'm with mm-hmm. you. I'm listening. And with you doesn't mean I have to take on what you're sharing or absorb it or make it mine or make it my struggle or make it my pain like that I can be with you in your listening. And I think that's what makes the conflict shift is that I'm not, I'm not there trying to solve it, I'm not trying to get the solution. I'm just uh, making space to allow it to come out. And the kind of listening I do, the deep listening I do allows more and more to come out. And then we can be with it together. We can look at it together. You can look at it. I can look at it. We're seeing something shared in a, in a moment. And when I'm doing that and that kind of listening, that's, I think, the alchemy. And I don't, I, I don't have words in the, um, you know, in this plane to talk about it. It's something else. It comes from a different plane, uh, spirit of heart, of soul. I don't know. But there's something else that, that transforms in that quality of listening. And so I think if there's one thing to do is like, how can I, how can I strengthen my own listening is the question that I am with all the time. Um, mm. and continue to like work out that muscle like I work out all the other muscles. And, and I do. Yeah. I'm struck how that particular piece too is something we can bring to our, our virtual spaces if we set the intention to do it. You know, it's Definitely. pretty hard for us to all gather in a beautiful place in nature together um, or to do some of the other things. So I'm excited to see how your work unfolds in virtual space and to learn more about that going forward uh, as well. Yeah, it was great, you know, and I was, I was here thinking, actually, uh, I started uh, saying something about walk, walk out, walk on, and it feels like this is, this is a big invitation to all of you hearing us to walk out of, of destructive patterns of, of relating with each other, with ourselves, with each other, and with the world around us, and walk, walk on towards more healthy and regenerative co-liberating and collaborating spaces so thank you so much Shilpa for this it was lovely thank you so much thanks for having me both thanks for this important work it's so crucial in this time so thank you thank you